Hi everyone. So in this second video we're going to talk a little bit about Fourier coefficients and um, once we have them, how we use them. So we should sort of collect ourselves and see what exactly it is that we know at the moment. So what we've shown is this, that if f of t is equal to the sum from n equals minus n to n of cn e to the 2 pi i n t, then we can find the cn's by integrating from 0 to 1, the period of the complex exponential we're working with, of f of t times e to the minus 2 pi i n t dt. And going one step further, we say that this is actually f n, which is the nth Fourier coefficient. And we haven't talked about when we can do this yet. So we have one big outstanding question, which is when can we do this? And it's going to turn out to be the case that for functions with jump discontinuities, um, that we're going to need infinite sums of Fourier series to make this work, which is really going to beg the question of when we have convergence and when we don't. What conditions do we need? So one extension that we're going to be looking at is um, when this makes sense. When does an infinite Fourier series makes sense. And then there's another big question that I'm going to try to illustrate with some uh, visuals, a demo, which is um, what can we do with f hat? That is, what does the spectrum tell us about what's going on with a function? Now. The first thing I'm going to do is I actually want to answer maybe a more immediate question was, does this really work? This question is also asked in the book, but the basic idea is if I take some sort of function, just given some f, does the Fourier approximation actually do it? And how closely does it do it? So what I've done is I've built out some model problems in MATLAB, and we're going to go through um, a numerical illustration of what the Fourier uh, approximation for a function is and what it looks like with some particular attention to some features that we see in Fourier approximations that are sort of part of the mix. This is in MATLAB. This is a demo that I wrote up earlier today. I'll be posting this on the Canvas page as well. So let's start with some periodic functions that maybe we, we know we can't handle with some of the things we've already done. Um, we know that Legendre polynomials do not approximate the square wave very well. So this is the square wave. And the particular function I used uh, is a, in a package you can import into MATLAB, but it's this square function here. And I've got the 10 in here so that I can model a function of a, of a given period. The way that the square wave function is put into MATLAB, it has a period of 2 pi. So if I want to have that function repeat more often, then, for example, I could change this number. Um, I could put a pi in here, and then it should repeat five times in the block that we're talking about. And you can see it does. Okay. Now, let's take that square wave and let's build a Fourier series out for it. And so this might look like a confusing mash of uh, computer commands, but the core of it is this computation right here. And all that is doing is it's computing the jth Fourier coefficient. Trap refers to the trapezoidal method for numerical integration. So I'm just numerically integrating, integrating the function y, which is the square wave, 
against e to the minus 2 pi i j x, where the j's are going to range over the number of terms that I want in my Fourier series. We can see that if we run this for n equals 1, we don't get a very good approximation. If I start increasing the number of terms of the Fourier series, though, we should find that very quickly that the Fourier series, that is, so this is just the n equals 5 term, which means we're only dealing with functions that have uh, frequencies 1, 2, 3, 4, and 5 hertz. And already we've got a reasonable approximation of the square wave. If we start including more terms, the terms that are really going to matter are the terms that reflect the period of the function that we've written here. So it's possible that I could add a lot more terms and get no contribution from those terms. If we increase the number of terms drastically, then we'll find that the Fourier series actually very closely starts to approximate the square wave. So as you make more and more terms in the series, the approximation gets better and better. At some point, what you're going to see is something weird happening, where even though we have the function tightening in around the tops of the square wave, we're getting these peaks on the outside. And that's a very important phenomenon called the Gibbs phenomenon. And what it refers to is the fact that anytime you have a jump discontinuity, you're always going to get this inaccuracy in the approximation of your function with a Fourier series. So even though we have the Fourier series converging to the square wave, the sense in which, in which it's converging is that the difference in area between the two graphs is going to zero. And that can allow for discrepancies in the behavior of the function and the behavior of your um, approximating function. So the idea here is that this actually worked pretty well. You had a square wave that had uh, period 5 in the, uh, between 0 and 1. We stuck a Fourier series together. This is an 80-term Fourier series, which really means it's a 161-term Fourier series. And we get a reasonable approximation of a square wave. The next example that I'm going to show you is called the sawtooth wave. So this is another sort of wave that comes up in signals and processing and modes of vibration. Um, same deal as before. Uh, we, the sawtooth wave, this particular sawtooth wave has period uh, 5, so or frequency 5, so it's going to repeat itself 5 times in the course of the interval from 0 to 1. Like before, as we increase the value of n, we should find that our approximation gets better and better. And so let's do that. So we'll just add some terms. And here, again, you can see that very quickly, even only in a seven-term series, that you're getting behavior that very quickly starts to approximate this pretty discontinuous function. And it's always been amazing to me that uh, these periodic functions can have this kind of diagonal behavior where they can go up almost like a straight line and then drop back down again increase some more terms and you can see the sawtooth wave starting to form and of course the more terms you add the tighter the approximation gets but just like before because we have this um, jump discontinuity here we're still going to see this Gibbs phenomenon at the corners that is there's always going to be a little region at the discontinuity where our approximation is not as good as we would like it to be so let's look at the triangle wave So this one doesn't have a jump discontinuity. And so what we should see is that when we start computing its Fourier series, we should not get Gibbs phenomenon in the same way. We would expect the approximation to be very good. And in this case, uh, it is very good. So if we just add some terms to our Fourier series, even with n equals 7, we can see that we're, still getting, we're already getting a really tight fit to this uh, continuous function. And if I add some more terms, very quickly it becomes apparent that the approximation is almost perfect. And we don't see the Gibbs phenomenon in this case because we don't have jump discontinuities. So corners are okay. It's just jump discontinuities are the problem, where you start at one point and then you break and leap up to another value of y. To give you an idea of the way that the Fourier series is used um, in a lot of applications, uh, frequently the functions that you're dealing with are not functions that have nice formulas, but just a big pile of data. So Maybe you're looking at something like this, just a mess of x and y points. And there's not a clear function living inside there. What the, Fourier, uh, what the Fourier series can do is even with this kind of noisy data, a Fourier series can actually recover the original function that built this up. 
Now how did I make this? I took a square wave and I've added a small amount of randomly generated noise to the square wave. So you can think what's happening is it's going up and then randomly wiggling around uh, y equals one and then falling down just like the regular square wave and randomly wiggling around y equals minus one and then back up again. So this is about as badly discontinuous as a function can be. It's just wildly wiggling. But even in this case, the Fourier approximation, at least in the discrete version of what we're using here, after all, it's still happy to integrate. This is a numerical integration. Um, it can do this. It just goes point by point and multiplies and adds up the area. And if we find the Fourier series by cranking up some of the terms, we can see that the Fourier series is actually recovering the square wave. So even though it can't see the square wave because of the noise, the Fourier series is powerful enough to pull the original function out of the noise. And as usual, we see the Gibbs phenomenon at the corners near the jump discontinuities. So this is the first sort of applications that you use Fourier series for, for taking functions that are not amenable to calculus, right? After all, calculus doesn't work on functions that have discontinuities, but you can take functions that are discontinuous and model them with very nice continuous functions by approximating them with Fourier series. In many applications, you have functions that are badly discontinuous and you need to recover what the original function was and a Fourier series will also do that for you. The next thing we're gonna talk about in the next demo is going to be how you pull the functions apart using the Fourier transform to look at the frequencies of the approximation and what the harmonics are that are living inside the Fourier series that are the really important ones. All right, so I'll see you for that video.